All right. I just finished jotting down my talking points, which today is on the wall up here. But basically, I'm basing this upon my own presentation yesterday, also on Sean's mm -hmm. presentation of the um, astrology and explaining what I would portray as the Esoteric Sermon on the Mount, which is, can also be subtitled The Enigma of the Segmented Mind. Now, Christians don't really understand the implications of the Sermon on the Mount. And they seem to have said, you know, since Jesus nailed the Lord to the cross and they don't have to really observe it, that they don't understand even the purpose of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. On my first heading here, I have ideology invoked by natural law. Why, and the, which raises the question, why does people perceive the world of, of, and all of life differently, one from the other? Let's face it, this is a world of opposition, dissension, opinions, often most of them conflicting. All the countless variations of opinions that divide mankind are all caused by the laws creating these differences. And these differences are of the utmost importance to self, to each individual here especially those wishing to advance mentally and spiritually. Actually, the, our colleges and whatnot are actually dumbing themselves down because of their political correctness. People are liberal or conservative, religious or non-religious, Marxist or capitalist, as well as all the ideological differences because the laws of creation force them into the role. Often they have no choice. All sects and philosophies are predicated by the natural laws of the universe. This was understood by the deists especially, and they formed the bedrock of our constitutional form of government. And the deists actually learned it through past lives as the disciples of Jesus. Why were they deists? And they seemed to be against the church because the church is against the teachings of Jesus. Not only that, but for advancement. Because the, as I'll get into later on, the tree of life must maintain balance across the spectrum of consciousness on a cosmic scale. In the same way the tree of life exists within us, it exists like Kabbalah and whatnot tries to portray as a cosmic tree of life. Again, a holographic reality means that everything is replicated within itself at a, every level. So if the tree of life exists within us, and that's the one we're dealing with internally, it also exists externally on a cosmic sense. And All right. forced, sorry, forced in terms of the conditions they're born under, the laws they're born under, their life script, that's what's kind of forming. Everything is scripted to support that where, where in the cosmic tree of life they're born, right. according to the laws. So, on my title of natural law in our culture, my first point is that Jesus taught the tenets and realities of natural law. He did not teach religion as we would determine religion, some belief in the unknown or opinion or whatnot. He taught the realities of, of law. If our nation's lawyers had greater vision, the Sermon on the Mount would be taught in law school. Why? Because it's paramount in our lives, in the creation of everything we do, everything we experience. Are you listening to this, Rick? Mm -hmm. You especially. What'd you do? Are you here to expand upon that so we're all If our nation's teachers understood the realities of life, the Sermon on the Mount would be taught in our schools instead of the Bible being removed, but they would teach the Bible on the gospel not as a real belief in the unknown but a means to discover and observe and find what we call unknown. Without the knowledge of natural law people remain a victim of self-ignorance which is what we see today because the people do not understand the natural laws. Without the knowledge of natural law it would remain impossible to comprehend the realities of life. I don't 
don't care whether your path is through science, through religion, or anything there is. Without understanding the natural law and how it works, it's impossible to progress. So it means this is a understanding what we're talking about today is of the utmost importance. Now we have natural law and cause and effect. Some people will call that calm. All events that transpire in this world are brought about by natural law. All the experiences that each individual has has a causal factor that is predetermined. Everything, it's, it was predetermined that we're here today. It's been predetermined that we know each other. Even Adam from South Africa, I felt it was predetermined that your wife didn't come. Everything here is predetermined. And there's a causal factor that we must understand to progress. Nothing's by chance, nothing's by pot luck, nothing's by the luck of the draw. Everything has a causal factor. Edgar Casey proved that future events could be foreseen. What did he have, a 90-something prediction rate on all the events he predicted? With the knowledge of the laws, many calamities, including earth shifts, can be averted. All mankind possesses the innate ability to perceive and understand the causal factor of what they experience if you develop the intuitive spheres of mind that can perceive the past, the future, and also within you. And then there's a communication between the linear and the intuitive that assist you in taking the uh, action that's best for you in that instance. Next slide is called three-dimensional vision. As the mind expands and deepens, the person begins to perceive the causal factor that has orchestrated the events of their life. In my seatbelt motions and cases, I said, as you develop the intuitive, you begin to perceive these problems that you encounter on the road. I gave the example of motorcycle riders who stay awake because if they don't develop these intuitive abilities, they soon end up dead. So perhaps in some ways riding a motorcycle is better than the safety of a car. The studies in England that Rick has brought up in his failure to present his case in Australia demonstrates that when people put on seat belts, they actually have greater problems on the road because this feeling of safety inhibits the intuitive mind from working. Now, they can't explain this, but it's a fact. As the mind expands and deepens, the person begins to perceive the results of the choices they are presented with. Now, as I drive down the road, I try to, I always make contact with the person, the people I see. I intuitively receive and I project. I can usually make people pull over by projecting into them when they're going too slow in front of me. I can make people who are doing their thing even on a text phone when I'm riding on my motorcycle especially, I can force them to look at me. And I, on another level I communicate with them, same way I communicate with my parrots. Pasta time and Zeus jumps up and down. These are all within the ability of man, but you have to develop these abilities. As the mind begins to expand beyond organic and three-dimensional limitations, the causal and results factors begin to become apparent. Now, of course, there's always a causal factor, which is usually created by a pre-existing cause, but then you also have, well, what is the choices of what I'm going to do? And this is how the aware mind, the conscious mind, begins to make their choices based upon what's the best. Sometimes what's best is not always convenient, but it has the best income, outcome. Greater vision and understanding is added as the person is able to begin to communicate with the past life person that was part of the causal factor in the present, as well as direct communication with the higher soul self. 
What does that mean? That means that what I'm experiencing right now is often caused by a past life personality that my soul lived. That's why I joked yesterday and I said, in a way, I'm my higher self, soul savior. I'm saving him from himself. I'm dealing with what was left for me to do. Which, of course, is a different position than the Christian. We're all sinners and whatever and everything else, which is all a lot of nonsense. All right. I often portray this world as a living biofeedback organism. All events we experience have been orchestrated by our own past thoughts, desires, actions, and deeds. We're living in a biofeedback machine, and while it can't give us instantaneous movement, it will in the future. This is why when they asked Jesus to pray, Jesus said, pray for the kingdom. Okay, pray for the kingdom to come within you. You got all things. This is why the Buddha said, let go of all the things of this world. Don't be attached to them. Because those attachments will obstruct you. This realm is a living biofeedback organism that brings about soul advancement through the events and realities we experience. There is no chance encounters. Everything we experience in this world is based upon something in our past and something that is needed in the future. We're all born to this life for a reason and the role we play this part of the stage we, we are doing. Whatever our plight in life is, what we experience is exactly what we were supposed to experience as orchestrated even before we entered into this life. Now a lot of people don't like that. Allison, you were born to be with your husband. So was all the rest of them. All those all those terrible relationships from the past, they were a learning experience that we had to endure and hopefully we overcame. If not, then we'll continue with it in the future. <laughs> well, only if you do the right thing right now and break and sever the karmic ties. Then you might want the relationship. Why is there evil in the world? I have a whole section written on this in the Christian Reincarnation website, but for a short thing, evil is merely the exercise of free will. If man did not have free will and could not live out his thoughts and experiences, then he would never grow. The expression of evil is necessary for our own growth towards perfection, wholeness, and completion. The greatest learning experiences are often brought about through negative interactions. When properly embraced, most negative experiences can be embraced and supercharged into positive outcomes. I often say by embracing the negative, you supercharge the positive and never take credit. I say, well, we don't call ourselves a teacher because there's one teacher. So if I call myself a teacher, then I've hit my limit. If we were charging for entrance into this place, then we'd be limiting ourselves. Hopefully everybody will freely do and give and whatnot and do work and, and organize and assist the others. All experiences of life have a higher purpose and objective. All of them. They're all there for a reason. You may not understand it at the time being, but there's a reason behind it. Which means the world is exactly as it's supposed to be, which means you have to stop trying to fix it. You have to stop trying to see its fault. You have to stop putting a negative cloak upon it, saying, oh, only if we could change this or change that. As a re to understand the reason, and then you can deal with the reason. Which leads us to the saying in the Revelation. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. And that's one of the most important statements in the scriptures, right there. The rest is just karma. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. But that's not as important as that statement of captivity. 
Captivity must be understood as any one person or group of people forcing their will upon another in any way. Now, of course, you have a right to protect yourself. You have a right to insulate yourself from negative influence, but you don't have the right to force somebody into a role unless they're, what they're doing is harmful to you. Which is what? You have conservative, uh, um, liberal, and you have, what's the other one? Progressive. No, the uh, libertarian, which is, of course, the epitome of libertarianism. Our Constitutional Bill of Rights not only promotes individual freedom and liberty, but inhibits church and state from making the grave error of dictating to others, denying them free will. And that's an important statement, because if you empower others by proxy to deny the rights to others, then you are, make yourself part of the equation, and you will lose your rights in the future. How is a person born into a place like Cuba? Because they supported governments that denied rights to other individuals. No doubt these men who are over in Islam, they're going to be born as women in burqas. Or some way, they're going to be constrained. Whatever conditions of your birth, there's a reason for the conditions. And it's usually because you inhibited others, mental and I, uh, no one and no worldly government authority has the right to inhibit the freedom and liberty of others. That's a blanket statement. When we inhibit the exercise of free will to others, then we enslave ourselves in what Jesus portrayed as the prison. Quoting from the Gospel of Matthew, make friends quickly with your opponent at law. Now we're not talking about lawful courts, we're talking the laws of the universe here. While you are with him in the way, notice the term the way. So that your judgment may not hand your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent or farthing, which is what the original says. So once you enter into a karmic interaction, a karmic shackle, that'll remain with you until you resolve it. The next one is entitled The Karmic Prison. Whenever we inhibit the freedom of others, not only is our own freedom inhibited, but we create a karmic shackle that follows us from life to life. The majority of people out there are not free to come here. They can't hear what we're saying here because they're too restricted mentally. What did the Buddha say? The Buddha said, let go of all attachments. You can't be attached to those people out there have these attachments, these karmic attachments, and make progress. That doesn't mean you can't have attachments. You can have attachments to those who are with you and who are helping you. This karmic shackle in, it inhibits us from making any real spiritual pro progress until the debt is satisfied. Ignorance of the law inhibits people from advancing beyond their present limitations. It is man's birthright to exercise free will and to understand the ramifications of the natural laws. The fact that the church has failed to do this job that they were imbued with is the failure of the church and is constraining all the Christian world from not living out what the gospel teachings are. And they're important. Proceeding to the verse of, in Matthew, which I read, it states, I'm going backwards in some of these verses for a reason. It states, therefore, if you are presently presenting your offering at the altar, now the altar is when you're, you're making your body into an altar and you're trying to have the kingdom come within you. So you are the altar, you are the living altar. 
Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. So long as you have that attachment, that karmic attachment to these others, and you owe a debt, you cannot come to the Lord. So long as we have a karmic attachment to others, no real progress can be achieved. Here's a really biggie, like my wife pointed out today when I called the guy the idiot that pulled out in front of me. <laughs> I said I shouldn't do that, but he was an idiot. But he didn't know, and I didn't say it to him. It's not the same. Again, we're going the preceding verse to the prison statement. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to a brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now he means the hell is part of the prison, the internment. The prisons that, the karmic prisons and shackles that people put on themselves in this world because they're ignorant of the laws. But I, and this is a word directly spoken by, supposedly by Jesus, that the church never ever brings up. This is one of these words you'll never hear them talk about. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Which means that we must be positive in movement towards the kingdom, towards progressing. Epistle of James, quoting in support of what was put forth there in Matthew. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of inequity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Meaning that every word we speak comes back upon us. Same as the gospel says, every idle word you'll have to give account. Well, here every word you speak, you're invoking the laws because this world is a living biofeedback machine. We invoke the laws with the words we speak. The laws can imprison and enslave us. We remain attached to others by virtue of the, virtue of the words we speak. We invoke the karmic law. This should be taught in our schools. This should be taught everywhere. This should be common knowledge of the laws, not religion. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with the laws. Self-observation and exploration, exploration of self with the encounters with others. That has to do with the laws, especially. All encounters with others provide us a reflection of our own self. That's the bread machine. All reflective <laughs> encounters are an opportunity of self-discovery. Not only can we free ourselves from previous debts in our interaction with others, but we have the ability to bring about our own advancement. These attachments and the laws are not religious. You can't classify the laws as being religious. The reality of life, a fact of life, as much as any other fact of life. Like gravity. Like gravity. But are important elements of laws which control this world. Can't say it's going to be religious that I'm going to drive on the right hand side of the road in the United States. I clarified that for our distant friends here who drive on the left hand side of the road. The wrong side. The wrong side. Well, that's we here is the wrong side. side. <laughs> it's a different. Pol it's a dip it, They're they're manifesting a different polarity of mind because they're using different aspects of mind to drive on the left hand side of the road. I actually prefer to drive on the left hand side of the road. I mean, where it's that's the. It doesn't matter. Me. I take up the whole road anyway. There's one place in Virginia where they've switched. Uh, they put the. They've switched 
the lane so that you drive you do drive on the left side. It's probably good for you Just in some one ways. Place. But anyway, in the same way that people who drive on the right hand side of the road in this country, it's not a religious observance, it's a matter of law. In these reflective encounters with other people, not only do we free ourselves from the previous debt, we have the ability to bring about our own advancements. And these, again, these attachments and the laws are not religious, but an important element of the laws which control this world. I'm going to read a little bit here from Modern Science, some of my favorite statements, which dispels the idea that science and religion are in conflict with each other. Quoting physicist Walter Thuring, where he wrote about matter, that modern physics, quoting, has put our thinking about the essence of matter in a different context, that has taken our gaze from the visible, what we see, the particles, to the underlying entity, the field, the unseen. The presence of matter is merely a disturbance of the perfect state of the field in that place. Mr. Thuring says something accidental, one could almost say a blemish. I don't believe it's accidental, it has a causal factor. Of course, I have greater vision into the field than Mr. Thuring did. According, there are no simple laws describing the forces between elementary particles, which is what we see. Order and symmetry, symmetry must be sought in the underlying field. The causal factor, the source of it, which is in the unseen. Again, one of my favorite quotations, where I write in the February 1979 Psychology Today interview with brain scientist Carl Pribum. The world which he attempted to describe confirmed the vision witnessed by the ancient mystics and enlightened wise men where he wrote, it isn't that the world of appearances is wrong. It isn't that there aren't objects out there at one level of reality. We all see these walls, we all see our bodies, we all see these computers, we see these tables. They're there. And that's what he's acknowledging. It is that if you penetrate and look through, look at the universe in a holographic system, you arrive at a different reality, one that can explain things that have hitherto remained scientifically inexplicable. Paranormal phenomena synchronicities, the apparently meaningful coincidences, coincidences of events. More recently, cybernetics, I can't say the word, David Foster described an intelligent universe. So when we say we're all dwelling within the mind of God, what he's saying is confirming that the universe is not this hard concrete nothingness, matter, that it's thought projected into these symbols that we see. Whose apparent concreteness is generated by cosmic data from an unknowable organized source. The reality of the holographic theory says that, this is again quoting, our brains mathematically construct hard reality by interpreting frequencies from a dimension transcending time and space. The brain is a hologram interpreting a holographic universe. When each of you pass from this life, and you find yourself on the other side out of your body and you're looking down at your body, you will find that you'll be able to walk through the walls that the rest of the people see as obstacles. Pass right through them. Um, you'll be able to go move from place to place just by thinking yourself that. You'll still be able to observe the goings on in this world. You won't be part of it, but you can see it, and you'll see that what we see as concrete is not concrete at all. It's nothing but projected thought. As long as you're in the body, you're part of that drama. One of the most interesting denials, since we're on this subject, of the near-death experience is the fact that while it's true that some people just hover above their body, the critics of the near-death experience only focus on those. And they say, well, is the brain going through some sort of lack of oxygen thing and it's, 
and it's, it's imagining these things. But there's been many, many, many cases of people going into other rooms or distant places, observing who's in attendance, listening to what they're saying, and reporting back to them what was going on. Like the person who originally floated up above their body, saw that they were working on, and then found themselves drifting into the outside room in the waiting room, where they could see, oh, so-and-so came, and so-and-so came, and this one's here, and this is what they're talking about. This cannot be the brain starving from oxygen. But the critics choose to ignore these cases. And there's many. There's some times where the person found themselves projected into a distant home to see people grieving, having received a phone call, or whatever the circumstances are. In a near-death experience, anybody who was able to have an out-of-body experience knows that they can pass right through matter, what we see as matter. So what we are seeing is matter, it's only because it's hard concrete matter, because we're in this dream that we're having in life, this interaction. It's not. And of course they will call people like me crazy, but we're starting to outnumber the, the critics. But this is what they're saying, the scientist. And the scientist is basically confirming what the mystic and the visionary has known all along. One of my favorite people is Einstein. He knew a lot more than he stated, which is true of all people who know that. I write, the findings and of the modern physicist totally supports the analogy of Plato's cave, as seen in the word. Now, Plato's cave, we, we watched a, a uh, supposedly spiritual group not too long ago totally ignoring Plato's cave to their own detriment. They're just not ready, they're just not intellectually and spiritually able to conceive of what the meaning of Plato's cave is and its ramifications on our daily life. Einstein wrote, there is no place in this new kind of physics for both the field, which is the unseen, and matter, for the field is the only reality. That means all this that we think we see here, the illusions, is not the source. It's the effect. Reality is in the unseen. And if we want to enter in a world of reality, then we have to develop the ability to perceive reality. In the analogy of Plato's cave, the prisoners are only able to see the shadow images that are danced upon the wall of the cave, just like we only see the downstream shadow images. In much the same way that the physicist portrays the objects we see in this world as a blemish that has been created by the intersecting forces within the field where they come together, which, mean, which, which man can't see with his organic physical senses. Why can't man see with his organic physical senses? Because his senses, physical body senses, are made up of earth matter, only perceives earth matter, doesn't perceive the, what's in the field. And the same way that Einstein portrays the source of what we observe in the unseen field as the only true reality, the analogy of Plato portrays the shadow images being danced upon the walls of the cave as illusion. But it's not really illusion. Now, this I reject Cato's, uh, Plato's position. It's actually an illusion. An illusion means it's it's projected. He meant it, but, but he shouldn't have used the word illusion. Modern, uh, modern physicists have proven that the particles of matter that we see with our physical eyes are connected in a non, another non-physical dimension that is beyond man's organic vision to detect. Why is it beyond man's organic vision? Because man's senses are made of earth matter. They must be developed and matured in order to see beyond the, what, the, what is these physical images. And that's what the physicist says portrays as the field. In the words of Einstein, again, 
We may therefore regard matter as being constituted by the, in the regions of space which the field is extremely intense. There is no place in this new kind of physics for both the field and matter, for the field is the only reality. Just like in Plato's cave, the source, the unseen source, is the only reality. Then I write, yet academia, for the most part, not only continues to ignore the fact that modern physicists have proven the ancient visionaries and mystics are correct, but our educational systems can you continue to promote the theory of evolution, which is easily proven to be based on upon a fraud. Why do I say evolution is based upon a fraud? Evolution says that everything that we see came into being normally, naturally, with no supernatural forces acting upon it. This has been proven wrong by modern physicists. If reality is in the field, and what we see is the downstream effect, then of course reality remains in the field, which means that Darwin was totally wrong. Yet every course going, going to school preaches Darwinism, as if physics never happened as if all the visionaries are wrong. These people maintain their own level of incompetence and ignorance. And this they call academia. Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, recognize what is in your sight and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. In other words, you're supposed to see the source and understand the source of all that you see in Plato's cave. By design, this is your birthright, but we fail to uh, develop our abilities. And our failure to understand the nature and reality of what we see remain drowning in a sea of confusion. Look at this world. It's, it's totally confused because they have slammed the door to higher reality. In total confirmation of the foregoing, Paul stayed to the congregation at Corinth. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul says, we don't look at the illusions of this world, which means also that Paul was saying we have the ability to see the source, to see the things that are seen to look beyond the temporal. And again, we'll go back to Einstein, who I feel knew a lot more than he could say, where he stated, only those who can see the invisible can do the impossible. And I agree totally with that statement. <laughs> again, the Sermon on the Mount is not religious. The Sermon on the Mount is a portrayal of the natural laws as if it was written into our Bill of Rights and enshrined in our constitutional form of government. That's what it should be. Because it's about natural law. It's not about belief in the unknown. It provides a means for us to gain the ability to perceive the causal factors that exist in the unseen field. The etheric. Therefore, these concepts taught by Jesus cannot be rightly classified as religious, but rather must be understood as lawful principles that each person must understand in order to advance beyond the limitations of carnal organic thinking. Now, I go into what, I, what this was supposed to begin. Everything here up to this point was just the foundation. And I write the next slide is the enigma of the segmented mind. One of my favorite subjects. If you don't understand the enigma of the segmented mind, you don't really understand anything. If you don't understand why, to me, I have to understand why something is before I can deal with it and, and comprehend it and expand upon it. I'd never take anything on blind faith. I don't believe in blind faith. Don't believe in empty faith or anything like that. Everything has a purpose, everything has a reason, and I'm here to understand that purpose and reason. So should everybody else be here. And it's within your ability to understand the purpose and reason of all things. 
The laws in the tree of life must maintain wholeness. What that means is that the mind, the cosmic mind, must be maintained in wholeness. And since the cosmic mind contains 12 spheres of mind, each sphere holographically imprinted with the pattern of the whole, that means this whole big pattern must be maintained across the spectrum of all of humanity. Each of us began our journey in this life as one cell embryo and could only be conceived as a single point within the construct and pattern of the tree of life. Can't take, the same way that you can't take a one cell and the whole entire soul be born into it, which we covered yesterday, the whole folly of the Eastern dogma. You can't do that because the soul is vast spreading across the dimension of time and all of the realms. You can't embody this in a one cell in the physical world. Neither can we embody the whole tree of life, the cosmic mind in one cell. And since wholeness must be maintained, that means each of us ends up to be one point, or one one hundred and forty-four thousandth of the whole. That number with the, Je the Jehovah's Witnesses only believe there's going to be 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses that go to heaven. Well, it means a little different than that. But they were never known for their understanding of the scriptures. And that's probably because they're so judgmental of the Catholic Church. I used to call their book the paper Pope, right Flo? They had all the answers. You're not allowed to think for yourself. You've got to ask the witnesses for the answer. So, in the same way the Catholics had their Pope and only he could interpret the scriptures, the Jehovah Witnesses had their paper Pope and nobody was allowed to think beyond <laughs> the limits of that book. <laughs> this is true also with most of fundamentalist Christianity. Yeah. In well, Islam, they and they tell you. in Islam, if you disagree, they kill you. It's inconceivable that they blow up mosques mm -hmm. and other groups. To me, that would be the most sinful thing that could be to blow up another mosque. But they do it all the time. They even put bombs inside of Korans and leave it there so they blow up all the people of worshiping. This is insanity. Religious insanity. It's not even religious. And to think that the left wants Iran to get the bomb. The left are out of touch with human nature and reality. Totally. Alright, so each of us began this existence as a one cell embryo. There's no way that the soul could come into that one cell embryo. And there's no way that the cosmic mind could be imbued within that one cell embryo. So what we end up with is we begin our life as one single point within the great cosmic mind. Now because of the powers and attributes of a hologram, we have the ability to expand that. But we have to understand what we see and what we observe in order to do that. The next heading is the Tower of Babel Syndrome. What's that? Because the laws must maintain wholeness and we are conceived as a single point in the cosmic tree of life, all the opinions and differences of mankind are the result of the unique expression of laws we were conceived and born of. Each of us is as if we are speaking a different language because we see things from that point of mind. Somebody else was born on as a different point and they see things from their point. And that's what the Tower of Babel is all about. This reality of the natural laws is a primary teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. It equally affects all of mankind. So it can't be called religious. It's an observation of the laws. Discernment versus judgment. The teaching on being non-judgmental is based upon the reality that what we see and observe in others is a reflection of our own self, often our own actions and past lives. When Jesus said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone, that word sin must be understood as transcending all previous lives which our soul has lived. Therefore, what should have been interpreted is, he that has not sinned in any life, let him cast the first stone. 
Jesus himself could not cast the first stone under those conditions because he evolved just the way we did. He started the same way we did. He just took more advantage of his opportunities. And all the spiritually advanced souls that are exist are no different than anyone else. They just happen to take advantage of their opportunities. Not by luck or chance or chosen few, but because they earned it. Perfect free market experience. When Jesus said, I, I did that, often we see the reflection of self in the image of our brothers and sisters. And when we judge rather than discern, we invoke the laws and judgment upon ourselves, causing us to remain in a karmic loop. One of my key phrases is empathetic discernment and reflective observation instead of judgment. At that point when we observe, when we observe others, perceiving our own reflection in that of others, we're able to triangulate and connect to our own inner soul mind matrix with the causal events that we are experiencing in the present. That's quite a statement. In other words, often what we see in the reflection of others is our own actions that came from our own past. And what, if we judge, then we continue the karmic loop. If we understand what we see, take responsibility for what we see, and move in the right direction based upon what we see, then we make gains. That doesn't mean we do the Christian thing and say, I don't judge. There's a difference between judgment and discernment. Discernment is ultra important. Important. Judgment just constrains us when you understand the laws. And as I said here, that leaves us at that point where we're observing. We can resolve our past debts, therefore freeing us our own selves from the shackles of the laws and using the reflection of what we see for the advancement of others and ourselves. Expansion and deepening of mind. When we observe, and you, this is important, there's a divine reason why each of us is born as a different point in the tree, cosmic tree of life. And that's for our own development, for our own good. We're all different. And we all perceive the world differently. When we observe and utilize empathetic discernment with others, we are then able to use their reflection to expand beyond our own limitations, based upon the natural laws we're born under, and the fact that we're limited to the point within the cosmic tree of life. In other words, instead of liberals condemning conservatives, denigrating them like they do, or Christians doing their, fundamentalist Christians doing their thing, they should capture part of their self in the image of what they see in the other. And you can't do that with judgment, you can only do that with discernment. But when you do that, you expand your own mind. Where you were born under a certain point within the cosmic tree of life, as you begin to annex these other parts within you, your own consciousness begins to expand. You begin to see things in a different way, much more expanded and deepening way. Your own higher soul self sits back into the realm of souls and observes all things as they truly are. Understands all things, sees all things, knows all things. If you want to get to that point, that means you have to understand what you see, exactly what it says in the Gospel of Thomas. You can't do that with judgment of right and wrong. You have to do that with reflective discernment. As is stated in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, recognize what is in your sight and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. Discernment. Discernment does not mean that we are complacent to evil. Often we must take action in order to overcome what we observe. Understanding that what we are experiencing has been brought about by causal factors. Can we do right for the sake of doing right? That's a question. 
To take no action when our brothers and sisters are being abused is a sin all in itself. So while we're not judging, we're also discerning. And if that's in within our power to help our brothers and sisters, then that's the action we should take. If it's not within our power, we won't be able to. But we must do so in a non-judgmental manner. Our constitutional frame is with deists who understood the absolute need for each person to have God-given freedom and liberty. Why? Because they must expand their own point within the cosmic tree of life, and they must be free to live in according to their dictates not according to mine, not according to yours, not according to any governments or any group. When we, are free the, when we free the enslaved, whether the enslavement is physical, as in physical slaves, to an ideology which can sometimes be even worse, to a religion or philosophy, then we, when we are able to free these people, then we do good. The gospel is written, was written to free the people from the enslavement to the mystery religion of Judaism. All mystery religions use extreme allegorical symbols that you have to be taught the meaning of. And the people who were almost the subjects of the Pharisees and Sadducees were slaves to that religious ideology. Much of it was burning animals in the temple or doing this or these extreme rituals they use. All that is nonsense in most instances. And the gospel is written to free the people. The Bill of Rights freed the people from the abuse of church and state. The only reason I'm here today speaking here to all you people and you people are talking here is because the church cannot hunt us down and kill us. The state isn't like China or Russia, or Cuba, that outlaws free thought, free expression. This was brought about by our constitutional founding fathers. In the 1800s, myself and others in this core group were born as Native Americans. In that life, our objective was to stop the Europeans from wiping out the red race. Why? All of man's races manifest a specific vibration. For saying this, by the way, I've been called a racist by some people in the past, that each race perceives the world differently, interacts differently. In spirit, when I first was introduced to this concept, they said each race breathes a different vibration in the consciousness of the earth. She'll tell you, she was in on that conversation actually breathes a different vibration in the universe. Same as oxygen, as the plants give off oxygen, each race gives off its own vibration and interacts with a different vibration in the cosmic earth. So when they tried to wipe out the red race, they were actually trying to exterminate that vibration. And advanced souls were born in order to stop the Europeans from doing that. I was among them. So was Emmanuel, probably so was Rick few others too. Flo was a captive white woman, but she didn't mind being captive after a while. I saw her and I stole her. <laughs> I admit. <laughs> she was eventually killed by fat squaw. <laughs> wow. There's a long story to all of this. Yeah, we need a whole other session. Yeah. My daughter's name, Riasha, comes from that life. And that was the name I gave her. It means star from heaven. All of man's races manifest a specific vibration that is crucial to maintain the cosmic balance of the whole across the spectrum of natural laws and the tree of life. All the races were brought to America in order to interact and maintain balance in a free culture and society. All the races that have come to this new world are here for a reason. Some were born against their will, but they were born to be brought against their will. Because they needed the races on the one continent. This is a little different version of what Obama will give you. Racial prejudice, like I said in a discussion recently with Adam, 
Racial prejudice is often caused by the cosmic laws that must maintain the purity of that racial vibration. If all the races were wiped, if a certain race was wiped out, then its vibration would no longer be there. If all Native American women married white men, then that racial purity would be lessened. So there's always going to be racial prejudice as a defense against being the race itself being watered down, the vibration no longer being in the earth from a cosmic perspective. Which means a core group within a race will always exhibit prejudice in order to put up a wall to integration, causing the race frequency to become watered down. There are white people who hate black people, black people who hate white people, Yellow people who hate this people, that people. This is all, man can't understand why. This segregation interaction is maintained by, the, some people will have no problem walking among other races. I've seen that in my own life. I have never had a problem with races. I used to work in some of the bad sections. Some, I've brought other people there, some of these liberals, and they were terrified of what they saw. I've never had a problem. It's almost like I walk down to other areas. I uh, in in Thailand, I could walk down some of the worst areas, just almost invisible, because I didn't give off that vibration that would attract them. Same as my dog sees weakness in people or or fear, and he'll attack. Does anybody know Jamaica Queens, New York? It's one of the worst areas in New York. I used to work there. I've also walked through the backwoods of Laos, Thailand, and whatnot. Never had a problem. Other people have. This segregation interaction is maintained by the natural laws. It's often beyond the control of mankind. Some people would be classified as rapes, racists because the laws have made them racist. And when you judge them as racist, you're bringing that judgment upon yourself and you're gonna end up walking in their shoes. Gender prejudice. We're getting near the end here. I decided to stick this one in. Gender, of course, represents opposite paradoxical power, uh, polarities. A certain group of women will reject men despise men. They call them liberated feminists or whatever you want to call them. Lesbians. A certain group of men will reject women. What we call them misogynists or whatever they abuse women. Sexual orientation is often the expression of those who by law are aligned by their own gender. Again, lots of them. People are born gay or homosexual. Some people are born this way by virtue of karma. You abuse a homosexual, you become a homosexual. You walk in the moccasins of those who you abuse or judge. That's the law. Others are born gay or homosexual by choice. Of course, that lifestyle opens up certain areas of mind to them which they can express. Often you see painters or very creative people even cooks like myself. Still others are born gay to assist others to break a karmic shackle. I've seen this many times. But sometimes if a close soul who's traveled many lives together, someone becomes enslaved in that lifestyle, the other person will be born with them in order to help them get loose, break the shackles of homosexuality which means, which opens for the last one, advancement is always through the interaction of opposites. This is why Gurdjieff used to say that while he had great compassion upon gay men, he always said they had limitations which could not be overcome so long as they could not interact properly with the opposite sex. Ideology. People are born polarized to a certain ideology. 
People are born into certain religions. People are born to enter into relationship with certain individuals. Many people are born into a marriage relationship. Many interracial marriages are ter determined before the people were even born into any given life. So when you judge them based upon your assumptions, you end up incurring karma. Which is why I write our judgments often enslave us and throw us into the prison. <laughs>